Tip number one, decide to turn pain into power. The only real power we have in the world is choosing our response. We can't choose what happens to us. We can get stuck into situations where we are abused, where we are not treated fairly, um, where any number of bad things can happen. And so the only choice we can make is how to respond. And I find that that knowledge gives me so much freedom because if something bad is happening to me that I can say is beyond my control, I can say, well, at least you know I have the power in my response to show the world what kind of person I am. And I can't tell you the number of really interesting examples of post-traumatic growth that we're now cataloging. People who've lost everything, people who've had their kids murdered in front of them, people who've had just every man manner of hardship who are able to choose their response. And rather than shutting down and, you know, getting more and more depressed, um, which is something that you have to get through. But the, the choice to take that painful experience and mold it into something positive for the world is I think the deepest kind of healing we can have as humans. And for me, I think part of what got me through those tough times, um, eventually as I matured, was the knowledge that I had transformed that into something good for the world. Tip number two, build grit every chance you get. And so I think grit was part of my upbringing and I'm actually really grateful for that because I think as an entrepreneur probably the most important attribute is not quitting and getting through just rejection after rejection. And most of the really successful entrepreneurs I know will tell me just how many people rejected them along the way. So if you can have a thick skin around that, it's actually a huge asset. For me, it was it was tough as a as a child, I was always kind of an outcast. Um, we never had enough money to shop at normal you know, clothing stores. Um, we didn't have TV at home, so I was kind of a weirdo on the playground. <laughs> um, I was a big nerd. I read books all the time and did science fair competitions, and I really found my refuge in academics and was really passionate about school. And so got lucky enough to get into Harvard, but didn't really have the money to attend. So I would, I would cobble together different jobs. I did, in fact, clean toilets for um, our campus. We call it dorm crew, but it's like a janitorial service run by students. So it's funny to imagine that at one point I was literally like scrubbing the shit off of the rich kids' toilets. <laughs> um, however, I, I do think that a lot of that, ki that kind of work is, is truly character building. I remember that summer, I would literally calculate the value of everything I purchased according to how many toilets it would take me you know, to clean to purchase that. And I, and I think it gave me this frugality and discipline which I then brought into my entrepreneurial career. Tip number three. You don't need to be a saint to make an impact. When we put people on pedestals as saints, we sort of, we turn them into an other. We turn them into, um, you know, we, we think of ourselves as us and, and lowly and we think of them as these saintly people who are just somehow different from us. And therefore, we don't have a moral obligation to do the things they're doing because they're uniquely equipped. Let's remind ourselves that some of the most famous and prominent social leaders were not flawless. MLK was a known, you know, cheater. He cheated on his wife regularly, unfortunately. Gandhi, um, it's well known in India, was really, really cruel to his wife. There's even a play that I watched about it, which was kind of shocking. And I guess the, the moral of the story is that no one is a saint. Um, you know, even when they're canonized, <laughs> they, they don't, there's, a, there's a whole book that criticizes Mother Teresa's work. And I'm not saying this to take down our heroes. I think that what all three of those folks have done is truly heroic and great and should be celebrated. I say this because it's important that we don't absolve ourselves of a moral duty to act. We all have that duty to act. You don't have to be flawless. These people are not, you know, genetically different. Um, and I think that's another problem with this pedestal issue is that when we put people on pedestals, we then start nitpicking and saying, oh, well, if he or she wears a nice dress, then she can't possibly care about poverty because she's too consumed with her own appearance. Or in MLK's case, you know, he was, many people tried to take him down because he had such great, I think, a great sense of style. Um, those two things are not incompatible. <laughs> you can have, you can have a, an interest in fashion and a desire to um, make aesthetic choices that fit your taste and at the same time find poverty to be morally objectionable and want to do something about it. People who do work in service of humanity do not need to be saints. We do not need to put them on pedestals. They don't have to, you know, take vows of poverty. I think when we, when we say that and do that, it makes ordinary people feel like they could never enter this field, and that's part of the problem.